Welcome to part two of the Federalist Era. Uh, we're going to analyze next uh, George Washington and Native Americans. Of course, this is going to be an ongoing issue uh, throughout throughout much of the first part of American history. This ongoing uh, conflict of culture uh, between Americans and Native American groups. Uh, of course, one of the major goals of the Washington presidency was to uh, help facilitate greater uh, movement and expansion into the Western territories, especially the Northwest Territory. And unfortunately, because of Native American groups in that region, Americans were unable to really move into that territory. Uh, one of the first efforts uh, to clear out Native American tribes from the Ohio River Valley uh, resulted in St. Clair's defeat, uh, which is uh, ranks up there as one of the worst defeats in terms of casualty numbers ever suffered by the U.S. Army. Um, you had a confederation of, of, of Native American tribes, if you look at this bullet here, uh, that we have, we have uh, a confederation of Western tribes led by Chief Little Turtle, um, who were supported by British opposition in that region. And um, made it very difficult for the United States to expand in these territories because of Indian opposition led by uh, confederations um, like the Western Confederation. Uh, Washington, in order to respond to uh, the threat posed by Chief Little Turtle, uh, sent General Mad Anthony Wayne into the Ohio River Valley to attack not only Indian, uh, but also British bases of support uh, in the Ohio River Valley, who was ultimately successful at what was called the Battle of Fallen Timbers. Battle of Fallen Timber Timbers is ultimately going to result in the, um, the opening up of land. Uh, for American settlement. Here you can see the map. Uh, you see St. Clair's defeat. This is the what we call the Ohio River Valley. Um, we know this is also part of the Northwest Territory. So some of the most significant um, Indian wars in the early Republic were located in the Northern Frontier. Um, so you see the, the early defeat of the American Army uh, at St. Clair's, and then Fallen Timbers. Um, and again, you, you look at these forts, these are British um, British posts that were held, as you can say, until 1796. So um, many of these Native American groups did receive significant support from the British. So Again, I'm going to leave these Hamilton songs um, for you guys to watch, to, to listen to at home. Um, this is something we talked about in class, uh, Washington on your side. You know, this, this idea that, you know, Alexander Hamilton represented um, a, a partner. He had a partnership with, with George Washington. And uh, they were essentially his career was linked to, to that of Washington. Washington shielded him, protected him. And um, you could say that as long as Washington was alive and was active, um, Hamilton experienced kind of free reign um, to, to operate in the political culture. So, but one area that we study in um, the Federalist era is really looking at Hamilton versus Jefferson. We talked about in video one, um, you know, that, you know, you do have materials that are available to you on the Google site. I actually attached a, a comparison chart uh, to this PowerPoint uh, showing the, the differences and the similarities between uh, Alexander Hamilton, the Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson, the Republican. So I found this infographic uh, a, a few years ago uh, showing today, um, today the, the, the left versus the right. 
when it comes to government. So obviously when we're thinking of the left, we're thinking of liberal and progressive. And we're thinking of the right, we're thinking of conservative or traditional. Um, and I, I love this infographic because it really helps to show you um, left of center, right of center. And what, what does each represent, you know? And, and, and so as, you, uh, as we go through and we study Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, Think about where each man would fall. On which side of the spectrum each 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 man will fall, and I think you'll you'll find it. It's pretty hard. It's pretty hard, you know, to say, you know, who's on the right and who's on the left. It's um, interesting exercise. So let's talk about foreign policy. Let, I'll go ahead and play this one. No, I won't. It's fourteen minutes. Highly recommend it, though. So the number one political issue that did more to create a two-party system in the United States had nothing to do with banks or assumption or excise taxes, but rather the French Revolution. So the French Revolution breaks out during the Washington presidency and will endure throughout much of the Federalist era. So when the French Revolution broke out, America was originally, originally, originally eager to support the French. I mean, after all, number one, Americans saw the French Revolution as basically a continuation of ours. Many Americans felt an obligation to assist the French. The United States at the time was deeply involved in French politics. In fact, at the time, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson was actually in Paris and actually helped collaborate with the French in order to um, create you know, this Declaration of the Rights of Man. Of course, Jefferson and the Republicans celebrated the Republican ideals of the revolution. Hamilton was initially, you know, quietly skeptical. Hamilton was skeptical of the revolution and he, he wanted like good trade and good diplomatic relations with Great Britain. And, and so he, he was very quiet in, in voicing any support or opposition to the French revolution. I think, uh, something that is important for you guys to know is that one key difference between Hamilton and Jefferson is that Hamilton tended to be very partial to the British. I mean, he loved everything British. He loved British, the British Constitution. He loved British systems of justice. Um, you know, in, in many cases, he, he didn't really mind monarchy, the parliamentary system. Right. So so he really wanted the United States to have Great Britain as its number one ally, whereas Jefferson was a big fan of the French. He loved their architecture, their philosophy. He loved their food, their culture. I mean, he loved everything about the French. So obviously the Jeffersonians, in terms of foreign policy, sought to draw a very close relationship to the French. Of course, France, another reason why many Americans on the outset of the French Revolution supported the French because they were a self-proclaimed republic who would serve as a tremendous ally, a republican ally, in a Europe that is dominated by aristocratic monarchical governments. So what ultimately brought the conflict to the United States? Why did the French Revolution ultimately become a extremely divisive issue? And then the answer is the reign of terror. So from 1790 to 1794, the French Revolution became increasingly radical. And as it became more radical, more and more Americans began to withdraw their support. 
After the French king, King Louis, was tried and executed, a war between the French and the monarchical nations, Great Britain and Spain, were inevitable. So understand that when the French Revolution breaks out, the people who are most afraid and fearful of the French Revolution are these European monarchs who worry that the wave of revolution would, would, would spill over into their country. So they wanted to, to really squash the French Revolution. And so war is going to break out um, eventually between the French and the British. Of course, during the reign of terror, thousands of aristocrats were executed as Christianity was replaced by deism. And so many Americans uh, objected to the French Revolution because the revolutionaries essentially renounced uh, basic Christianity. And the United States at the time, of course, is significantly um, Christian, right? So the big question was, to what extent should the United States still support the revolution? To what extent should we continue to celebrate this revolution going on in France? And, and this is really the decisive question. Now, Great Britain was ultimately sucked into a war with France again. Uh, George Washington, you know, so as I mentioned, as war is going to break out between the French and the British, uh, President Washington had to ultimately decide who are we going to back? Who are we going to support? Which side are we going to take? And he essentially answered this question without consulting Congress. And, and he answered the question by issuing in 1793 what was called the Neutrality Proclamation, in which he announced that the United States would um, adopt a position of neutrality, that we would not get involved in this war. And ultimately, uh, Republicans were infuriated they wanted the United States to be um, pro-French. Uh, the, Fr uh, the Federalists, uh, the Hamiltonians, were very supportive of Washington's policy. And ultimately, George Washington and his successor, John Adams, embraced a policy um, of neutrality. And, and, of course, there would be a considerable amount of challenges to this. I actually in included a link. Uh, to the Neutrality Proclamation. So if you will, I will let that pull up. So you actually have a copy. This is the his proclamation in which he announces that the United States would, um, would remain out of this war, you know, that they would remain um, free from any commitments to supporting either side. Um, we'll play this. The issue on the table. France is on the verge of war with England. Now, do we provide aid and troops to our French allies or do we stay out of it? Remember, my decision on this matter is not subject to congressional approval. The only person you have to convince is me. Secretary Jefferson, you have the floor, sir. When we were on death's door, when we were needy, we made a promise. We signed a treaty. We needed money and guns and half a chance. Uh, who provided those funds? In return, they didn't ask for land. Only a promise that we'd lend a hand and stand with them if they fought against the pressures. And revolution is messy, but now is the time to stand. Stand with our brothers as they fight against tyranny. I know that Alexander Hamilton is here, and he would rather not have this debate. I'll remind you that he is not Secretary of State. He knows nothing of loyalty. Smells like new money, dresses like fake royalty. Desperate to rise above his station. Everything he does betrays the ideals of our nation. And if you don't know, now you know, Mr. President. Thank you, Secretary Jefferson. Secretary Hamilton, your response. Come on. You must be out of your goddamn mind. If you think the president is going to bring the nation to the brink of meddling in the middle of a military mess, a game of chess where France is green and kingless, who signed a treaty with a king who's had his now in a basket. Would you like to take it out and ask it? Or should we honor our treaty, King Louis' head? 
Uh, do whatever you want. I'm super dead. That's enough. Right. Enough. Hamilton is right. Mr. President. You're too fragile to start another fight. But, sir, do we not fight for freedom? Sure, when the French figure out who's going to lead them. The people are leading. The people are rioting. There's a difference. Frankly, it's a little disquieting. You would let your ideals blind you to reality. Hamilton, sir, drop the statement of neutrality. Did you forget Lafayette? What? Have you an ounce of regret? You accumulate debt, you accumulate power, yet in their hour of need, you forget. Lafayette's a smart man, he'll be fine. And before he was your friend, he was mine. If we try to fight in every revolution in the world, we never stop. Where do we draw the line? So quick-witted. Alas, I admit it. I bet you were quite a lawyer. My defendants got acquitted. Yeah. Well, someone ought to remind you. What? You're nothing without Washington behind you. Hamilton. Daddy's calling. Oh, one of my favorites. One of my favorites. So what, what made the issue, I think, even more challenging is that a French foreign minister uh, came to the United States with the express purpose of trying to draw the United States into a war against Great Britain. Um, he represented the revolutionary government in France. His name was Citizen Genet. And while he was in America, he, he um, outfitted American ships to raid Spanish or British uh, commercial ships. Uh, he aroused anti-British sentiments throughout the United States by creating protests, drumming up uh, editorials in newspapers. Uh, George Washington ultimately threatened to deport Genet if he failed to uh, cease his actions. Uh, but unfortunately, by just simply allowing Genet into the country, the British uh, will ultimately see uh, an American-Franco alliance, which... You know, we know it's not it's not the case, but you know, sometimes appearances are are stronger than reality, right? So, see what I've got. Whoops, a little bit of a technical issue here. It'll be okay. I'm going to move forward to tensions with Great Britain. So, so throughout the Federalist era, um, the United States is really, really trying to stay, steer clear of war with either Great Britain or France. And so one, one of the great successes of both Washington and Adams is their ability to keep the United States out of war. So just understand there's tremendous tensions after the revolution. Britain is angry at the United States for failing to repay debts from before that date back to before the revolution. Um, they do see the United States as sympathetic to the French cause. And, um, and that's, that, that gives the British a great deal of alarm. And the fact is, after the American Revolution, many British loyalists who fled the United States, they still had not been compensated for their loss of property after the Revolution. And so by 1794, the British are, are seizing... Um, U.S. merchant ships, as you can see, that by 1794, were 300 ships seized by the British. Uh, we also see impressments. Those are kidnappings of our, our sailors. Um, so as, as our ships were boarded by the British Navy, our sailors were simply um, forced to join the British Navy. Um, so um, the British, by the way, by this time, they, they've got a, a severe shortage of sailors. Um, they don't have enough men to, to really man their ships. So the impressments of sailors is a, is a huge, huge problem that the United States government's gonna have to deal with for the next few years. The British, of course, are during this era are guilty of inciting Indian attacks against American frontiersmen. Um, and of course, we have a British refusal uh, to remove forts uh, from US soil. As you saw in that previous map, uh, we were talking about the Indians. Um, and, and this is a big impediment for our desires to expand into the Western territories. Now, despite all the bad blood, the United States is not interested in war um, with Great Britain. I mean, we're too dependent on their, on their products, um, their commerce, their trade. Um, but the Jeffersonians, the Jeffersonians uh, during this period are very aggressive in pushing for an, an economic embargo against Great Britain. And really by 1807, they're going to get their wish. So fearing that 
the United States might be sucked into a war with Great Britain, George Washington sent John Jay, uh, the Chief Justice of the United States uh, Supreme Court, uh, to go to Great Britain and to kind of smooth out the edges, uh, try to bury the hatchet. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, prior to leaving uh, for, for Great Britain, Alexander Hamilton is going to influence John Jay to bring home a treaty that favored uh, Federalist interests. Now, when we talk about Federalist interests, we're talking about New England to further the interests of New England and the Middle Colonies, or what used to be the Middle Colonies. Washington knew that without peace with Great Britain, our economic prosperity would be in huge peril. So the reason why we really needed peace with Britain is for economic reasons. We, uh, we were so tied to British trade that it was absolutely essential that, that uh, any potential war would be uh, mitigated or resolved. Um, so a treaty with Spain also, um, which we will see later on, um, really hinged on whether or not we can make peace with the British as well. Uh, the Federals did not want war with France. Um, and, and frankly, um, the nation was too vulnerable at the time. So if you look at the terms, the terms of the treaty, uh, compensation for U.S. merchants, uh, cleared frontier of British forts, resolved U.S. Canada border disputes, trade concessions, debt payments. Um, still, the British don't recognize our neutrality. They refuse to promise to halt impressments and ship seizures. There's no compensation for uh, British efforts to liberate uh, American slaves on board slave ships. And uh, there were no concessions for losses of exports. You know, when, those, when you have ship seizures, what the British are taking, they're taking exports. And most of these exports are agricultural products, you know, like rice and tobacco. And so this is really what hurt the, the Republicans. So the Republicans hated this treaty. And, uh, and they, they really sought to defeat the treaty once it was brought home. So the impact of Jay's treaty is it did bring about a massive, massive um, opposition, right, from the, the Republicans and from the Republican press. It says here, number one, Washington, for the first time, because of Jay's treaty, um, has become unpopular. Um, you know, one thing we learned about Washington, he's, he's got thin skin. He doesn't like opposition. He loves to be popular. Uh, the press began to take shots at him. Washington hated being criticized. Um, but he had to, you know, he had to approve the treaty. Uh, the treaty narrowly passes in the Senate and, and Washington reluctantly signs it. And it's because of Jay's treaty that Washington decides that two terms is enough. So he will finish out his second term and he will retire. Um, it was Jay's treaty that really drove him to Mount Vernon. Uh, the Republican Party's power, uh, because of Jay's treaty, uh, the Republican Party, Jefferson's party, actually saw its power grow uh, and galvanize behind his and Madison's leadership. Um, the, the treaty was at any at the, any at, at um, great. It was an anti-Republican treaty. It was too lopsided. It was too pro-Federalist. Um, one positive thing Jay's treaty does is it delays the war with Great Britain. It doesn't prevent war with Great Britain. Uh, we're going to eventually have war with Great Britain in 1812, but it definitely delayed the war uh, a few years. And by approving the treaty, an undeclared naval war is going to break out with France. Now that we've signed Jay's treaty with the British, now the French think that we are on the, that we are essentially uh, cast our lot, um, so to speak, with the British. So this is a no card term. It's called the Quasi War. So an undeclared naval battle, naval naval war, breaks out with the French. Um, and like mentioned in the previous slide, this treaty with the British paved the way for a second treaty called Pinckney's Treaty. This is also it's also a no card term. Um, which was a treaty with Spain, which ultimately gave the United States full rights to travel the Mississippi River 
and to use New Orleans as a port. So having been convinced that, you know, it's time to retire, um, Washington asked Alexander Hamilton to write what's called the farewell address. And um, he, he wants Hamilton to essentially, speaking for the president, kind of give some last um, bits and pieces of advice for the future. Um, now, the reason why Washington issues a farewell address, because I think he frankly believes that um, the country may not be able to go on without him, to go on without him as president. So he, again, he wanted to, he understood that his importance to the early Republic is that he is going to establish precedence. He is so well respected that he really believed that uh, American leaders would follow Washington's advice. So with the farewell address, I mean, this is an act, this is reflective of an act in which George Washington is actually going to give up power. And understand that in the world at this time, no one ever gives up power voluntarily. So this is a great act by Washington, you know, stepping down after two terms. You know, he really didn't want a second term. Um, he had been talked into it. Um, and but like I said before, he feared that few could keep the nation unified. And that's really what the purpose of the farewell address is. So you're going to need to know the farewell address. It's one of your outside readings. You know, in the farewell address, he he talks a lot about domestic policies at home. Uh, he warns of the evils of factions and political partisanship. Uh, he promotes the idea of Republican virtue, uh, meaning that leaders must put the interest of the public and nation ahead of their own self-interest. He also articulates ideas of manifest destiny. He says that the future of the United States was not to the East, not to Europe, but the future of the nation was to the West. So manifest destiny. Um, he promotes this idea that the United States is destined to uh, settle the West. He does say with foreign policy, and I think this is an extremely important part that you need to take note in, is that he encourages future American leaders to not make any alliances with European countries. He says, avoid entangling alliances. These alliances have a way of... Um, endangering the United States security by getting involved in some needless war. He says to be friendly with all nations, trade with all nations, but make alliances with none. And in doing so, Washington also establishes, and this is extremely important, you gotta know this, he establishes the precedent of isolationism. He says, we gotta stick to our own affairs. We can't worry about what Europe's doing. We gotta stay out of Europe. Um, if we expect to be prosperous in the future. He said to avoid debt, and he pushed for education for all. So with Washington out of the way, retired back in Mount Vernon, this now ushers in our second president of the United States, John Adams. John Adams narrowly defeats Thomas Jefferson Thomas Jefferson being the runner-up is going to be vice president. John Adams, in many ways, um, was like George Washington and the fact that he really sought to unify the American people uh, to rise above parties. He had a, a, a more difficult chore. Of course, you can see the 1796 election. John Adams with 71 electoral votes. Jefferson with 68 electoral votes. And Adams from Massachusetts, right? So the bulldog from Massachusetts is the second president of the United States. So who is John Adams? Let's remember, let's remind ourselves. Of course, we're first introduced to John Adams as a delegate to the First Continental Congress. And again, a delegate to the Second Continental Congress. He's on the committee that drafted the declaration. He's actually the, the, the founder that was significant in getting the votes 
in the Continental Congress to adopt independence. Um, he'll later serve as an envoy to, to France, a minister to the Netherlands, and a minister to Great Britain. And so, uh, in fact, after the American Revolution, it was John Adams that went uh, to um, do diplomacy with King George III. And, and, and King George III, in their first face-to-face -face meeting, actually turned his back to John Adams as a, as a way, as a slight. Um, and so uh, he is going to be humiliated by the king and by the British while in London. And, and he's not going to forget. He's not going to forget that. And, of course, the first vice president of the United States. So it is a tight election. Uh, the Federalists were wounded by the very unpopular whiskey tax. And, of course, as we just talked about the Jays Treaty, Jefferson, the runner-up, becomes vice president. This proves to be, again, I think one of the, the early flaws of the Constitution is, you know, it's, the runner-up just simply cannot be vice president. And eventually Jefferson will resign that post. Uh, but the issue that's going to preoccupy, in fact, guys, for John Adams, the issue that preoccupies his term in office is this quasi-war with France. This is what uh, Adams inherits from President Washington, a, a quasi-war um with France. And so by 1797, the French had seized over 300 U.S. ships and not wanting war. And by the way, this is going to be one of the great legacies of the Federalists is, you know, not only their, their, their financial and economic policies that really helped put the United States on the path of economic success, but also keeping us from war, uh, keeping us out of war. And so Adams is as much committed to peace and steering clear out of European wars as Washington was. In fact, he sent a delegation consisting of uh, Charles Pitney, Elbridge Gerry, and John Marshall, the future Chief Justice, John Marshall, to Paris to resolve issues with the French and to avert a full-blown war. While waiting to meet with the French and French foreign, um, foreign minister, Talleyrand, Three French agents, codenamed X, Y, and Z, approached the U.S. delegation, demanded a quarter of a million dollar bribe just simply to meet with the French foreign minister. Like, you know, you guys, you Americans, if you want to do any diplomacy at all with our foreign minister, you must first pay him, not the French government, but to pay the French foreign minister a quarter of a million dollar bribe. And essentially the American diplomats rejected it, and they just they, they told the French to go kiss a pig, and they came home. And when this, this was called the XYZ affair, and when Americans back home learned of the XYZ affair, you know, we have this, this famous uh, quote that came from a, a newspaper. It says, millions for defense, not one cent for tribute. So, the, so Americans felt humiliated by this attempted bribe. And so by the time this U.S. delegation arrived home from France, they found the nation um, caught up in a war hysteria. It's like everybody wants war. And so this is, uh, this is like the, the XYZ affair. Here you can see old King Dead Louis. You can think about how the French are portrayed here. It's like little demons, like little aristocratic devils. You know, there's the guillotine, and and this represents um, it says money, money, money. And this is like the the X Y Z affair. These are the this is the demands for the tribute, and it says cease barking, monster. We will not give you six pence. Pence is, of course, is a form of currency. So so this is um, this is this is a type of political cartoon that you found in American newspapers. And, and so American public opinion is definitely at this point, anti-French, you know, is definitely anti-French. So the fallout from the XYZ affair, it, it really what it did is it created a, a huge rift in the Federalist Party between the Adams wing who wanted peace 
who did not want war, and the Hamilton wing of the Federalist Party, what they called the High Federalists, who wanted war, right? So this, this issue with France is going to divide the, the Federalist Party between peace, those wanting peace, and those wanting war. And Adams maintained his commitment to neutrality. He ignored public demands for war, and he even signed, and of course this is going to be the subject of our debate, our in-class debate, John Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Acts in order to silence pro-war voices and to limit the influence of Republicans in government. So you've got first the Alien Act, which increased the period of time from five to 14 years, the, the amount of time that it would take for someone, an immigrant, to become a citizen of the United States. Why is that important? Because most immigrants at the time were anti-French. They were war agitators and pro-war. The Sedition Act, of course, which is gonna be the subject of our debate, prohibited criticism of the government policies, of government policies, its officers, and its officers, a violation that result in fines and imprisonment. So, um, so the government, the national government, began to um, arrest people who, uh, journalists, newspaper editors, who were openly calling for war with France. And, and so again, that's a, you could argue, is a major violation of the First Amendment, the free, uh, of the free press. And, the, and John Adams, uh, down here at the very bottom, he becomes known as the father of the American Navy because he begins to, the United States begins to militarize uh, in the eventuality that we end up going to war. So he, he helps construct a Navy. He begins uh, funding forts, the building of forts, um, building up coastline defenses in the potential of a, um, of a war, right, uh, with France. So these are forts. This is like Fort McHenry, um, which later on will become famous in the War of 1812. But this is... This is a type of fort that was constructed um, in the Chesapeake um, to help guard Washington, D.C. There's your, there's your um, French, there's your, uh, your Navy, building of an American Navy. In opposition, Sorry about that. Uh, in opposition to the Alien Sedition Acts, uh, Republican leaders, including Madison and Jefferson, you know, um, who believed that the Alien Sedition Acts were unconstitutional, uh, drafted anonymous resolutions opposing the Alien Sedition Acts. These are called the Virginia Kentucky Resolutions. You're going to need to know this. Um, uh, the Kentucky Resolutions were drafted by Jefferson. And of course, he didn't put his name on it because at the time he was vice president. And Madison was the, uh, he wrote the Virginia resolutions, um, which again, condemned the Alien Sedition Act. Um, so they basically promoted, uh, the Virginia Kentucky resolution promoted the idea that states have the right to nullify congressional acts that violate the constitution promoted the idea that Republicans had always championed uh, that, that they promoted the idea that Republicans had always championed that individual liberties must be protected from tyrannical government. And this is, according to Madison and Jefferson, alien sedition acts are a gross violation of individual liberty, the right of free speech, the right of free press. And so in opposing the alien and sedition acts, uh, Madison and Jefferson promote the, the compact theory of states, saying that in 1787, at the Constitutional Convention, the states created the Constitution, and that when the Union was formed, that the states joined the Union voluntarily. Therefore, the states have the right and have powers over the federal government, including nullification. The states, they argued, 
were the final judges as to the constitutionality of laws. Of course, I have a, uh, a copy of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions behind this link for you to, uh, to read. Okay. So ultimately, how did things play out? Uh, it's very simple. John Adams made peace. Uh, at the convention of 1800, John Adams sued for peace, ended up not going to war. Um, but because of the convention of 1818, uh, the French and the Americans basically decide to part ways. You know, that alliance that was formed during the revolution essentially came to an end. It ultimately averted a war with Napoleon. Napoleon is actually going to come to power in 1801. So, um, it actually turned out to be a good thing. It actually turned out to be a good thing that um, we didn't go to war. It, and by making peace with France, and this is what's really important, by making peace with France and avoiding the war cries and not following public opinion and not doing what's popular, it made the Louisiana Purchase possible three years later. John Adams considered not going to war with France to be his, quote, finest moment, but it also sealed his fate. It sealed the fate of his presidency. He is a one-term president. He loses re-election because he did not do, he didn't follow public opinion, and he did not follow Hamilton and many Federalists, you know, the wishes of many Federalist Party leaders. You guys, you can always go back and re-watch these videos. Um, I highly recommend it. It really helps accentuate what we're talking about today. So then we have a new election uh, in 1800 where he's going to run for president against his good, his old friend turned adversary, um, Thomas Jefferson. And of course, Jefferson will prevail uh, in the election of 1800. It's called the Revolution of 1800 because it's the first ever peaceful transfer of uh, power from one party um, to the next. And this election in 1800 was extremely personal. A lot of mudslinging, very nasty, very negative. Look, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll play this one. Some political watchers are saying this could be the nastiest, most negative election season of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and politicians start calling each other's names, it can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like they, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames? Female chastity violated? Children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. The nastiest, most negative election and they've been taken dirty to a whole new It can seem like a return to civility is not possible. So it was a very nasty election, um, and it was one in which ultimately uh, Hamilton prevailed, or not Hamilton. Yeah, Hamilton actually prevailed because um, he actually campaigned against Adams. Um, and, and that's kind of remarkable considering that Hamilton and, and Jefferson were uh, arch enemies. Uh, in the balloting in 1800, uh, they had 30, I believe it's uh, 36 ties. They, the Electoral College could not, uh, they were deadlocked. 
and ultimately it was Hamilton that that um, helped sway the election to his old nemesis, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Okay, so what we will do, I think, at this point, um, we will, uh, and this is basically, guys, this is basically where the Federalist era ends and the Jeffersonian period begins. And we will pick up more on the 1800 election in the next unit. Um, but of course, the um, Federalist era comes to an end in 1801 when Jefferson is sworn in. And like I said, we'll, we'll focus a lot more of that on the Jeffersonian period in the next unit. So thank you.